Welcome to Crawl Space. I'm Tim here today with Lance in the Crawl Space Studios in Wormtown. Lance, how are you today? Oh, couldn't be better. Couldn't be better, Tim. How are you? Oh, I'm just peachy. Good. And uh, for this episode, Lance, we have the panel that we recorded at CrimeCon 2019. I will never forget about this episode because it is the trivia question that I did not get correct on our Patreon trivia uh, game that we were playing uh, last week. The question was, what is our next episode of Crawl Space? I thought it was Dr. Lee Miller. Ah, uh, that's coming next week. Yeah, yeah. But I had uh, forgotten all about the uh, release of this panel. Well, it's a really good one. And I, honestly, I'll never forget about the panel because it was me, you, Bruce Maitland, of course, Brianna Maitland's father. We had Otavia Zapala of the Missing Alyssa podcast. And we had Jason Watts, who is an advocate for Brandon Lawson's disappearance. It was a really impressive panel, and it was really humbling to be up there with all of those people, all of the advocates and with Bruce Maitland, and just listening to everybody talk and how the individual stories, each respective story that they cover with Brandon Lawson and Alyssa Turney and Bruce Maitland and uh, Brianna's disappearance, as well as private investigations for the missing, all of those stories, all of their backgrounds somehow came together for a nice, cohesive informative panel. And it really is very entertaining and, and interesting and everyone really gets to share about the case that they're talking about. So I'm really proud of this one, Lance, and just want to thank everyone who was on the panel and everyone who attended CrimeCon, but especially this panel because uh, we really appreciate looking out there and seeing you paying attention and wanting to hear more about these cases. Yeah, and it was sort of the sleeper hit of the of live of crime panel con. of crime of, of, of 2019 everyone was saying it. any event in 2019 some people said cannibal cop some people said the dards but other people said nah it was that crawl space live panel okay so we'll play that in just a moment just wanted to remind you that our entire catalog our back catalog is available on stitcher premium at stitcherpremium.com and check us out on patreon at patreon.com slash crawl space podcast and how about five stars for the guys? You know, your cursor's hovering over the uh, stars right there. Just why not? Just pop it on over one more, two more. Pop us a five. Pop us a five. A fiver. A Lincoln. Thanks for listening, everybody. Brianna Maitland went missing in 2004 in Montgomery, Vermont. We have Otavia Zapala of the Missing Alyssa podcast. That's the first time I got that right. And uh, we have Jason Watts, who is an advocate for Brandon Lawson's disappearance in Texas. So to start off, how many people are unfamiliar with Brianna Maitland's disappearance? Okay, great. Yeah. <laughs> it's cool to be. <laughs> yeah. um, Bruce, can you, uh, can you start us off and introduce Brianna's uh, case and uh, where you're at now with private investigations for the missing? Well, I mean, if, if you're familiar somewhat with Brianna's case, she was leaving work and uh, about a, a mile from where she left work, her car was found bashed into the side of a building, uh, some things strewed around outside of it, and uh, no one has seen or heard from her since. Um, you know, there's had a lot of different people, a lot of different investigators working on it. Uh, there's been a lot of leads that have went nowhere, and some have just kind of gone to the end without going anyplace. And through kind of years and years of uh, working with the police and actually trying to do some of my own interviews with different people, and then and I ended up using private investigators to do some of the work for me and I had some at one time did a, a few that I realized that I didn't really want to use and then I came across uh, some that were very very good and uh, one of them Greg Overacker stuck with me for a number number of years so Greg and I have kind of hashing this out a little bit over oh probably at least two years before with the idea that uh, we should that uh, I should start uh, uh, private investigations for the missing because of my experience with private investigators and how much they cost and different forms of usefulness they have and that, that I just discovered that there's a huge need out there for people that don't have the money to be able to afford a private investigation and we see, I see 
police investigations from talking to so many other people I mean they, they just no matter where you're from or what you run into it's always the same thing I mean they they put a certain amount of effort into it uh, and they follow leads as as the leads come to them they follow the leads and and then after a certain amount of time uh, which happens way too quickly they, they just go into a mode where they if so, you know if they receive info someone walks in and says I know something at least in my case they will take a look at it but they don't do any real serious going out and trying to find leads and it's uh, also cases where the leads that often that they've interviewed people a lot of people just do not want to talk to and work with police for various reasons and they're willing to give information to a private source where there's uh, no threat of being maybe arrested for what they're doing at the time that isn't quite legit and so I found it to be very very useful and the combination of all that is just informing this organization I'm really encourage the fact that along with a lot of other volunteers and helpful and these two guys on my board uh, you know we can make this thing really work and be able to help people hopefully all through the country by supplying them a free investigator of the right mindset and the right qualifications to be able to help so many families that uh, kind of get to a point where I was a number of years ago where you need help and you can't necessarily afford that kind of help you did mention that you have uh, volunteers that are helping you out, and one of them just walked in, and I just want to make a uh, make a, a shout out a Michelle. shout out to Michelle here. Um, she is a savior for uh, organizing a lot of um, the mailing lists and print printouts and manning the table over there. So. Uh, if you want more information, you can you can go to their table and you can talk to Michelle and you can um, make a donation or you can get some more some more printed information. Yeah, sign up for the email list um, right outside, right over on that wall. Outside that wall, Bruce is there and and Michelle is are there and uh, sign up for uh, the email list for private investigations for the missing. And that's my, a good segue. Like, oh, sorry. Go. My girlfriend Ruth Ann is sitting back there too. And, and Ruth she's done a great well. job. And, and Thank you, you Ruth. Can see her at the booth and. Uh, which is a natural. Yes. Um, it's, it's, a, it's an, uh, a good segue into your um, relationship with law enforcement because in the beginning, uh, the case was not handled in a manner in that you were satisfied with, I think, is safe to say. That's safe to say. <laughs> <laughs> um, can you take us back to the early days of the investigation and how you discovered uh, Brianna's car and just those early couple of days or, or weeks some of that is a little bit foggy with me I do have some gaps because I was not in a very great state of mind uh, with a lot of that but um, I mean it, it's just a case of where her car was discovered before anyone knew that she was missing and um, you know the, the police at the time uh, she went missing on a Friday night. The police found her car on a Saturday morning, pulled it away from the scene, had it towed, and the officer went home for a long weekend, and, and everything just set in his file. And, uh, you know, so nothing was ever done. And, and uh, from there, it just kind of really went downhill from there for about two or three weeks. And, mm -hmm. and uh, the, uh, the circumstances with the car... It was backed up into the side of a house. It was, uh, was the house abandoned at the time? Yes. The house was abandoned yes. at the time, and the car was backed up into the side of the house. And it, it was originally spotted by a group that uh, they, they're, they're skiers, like cross-country skiers. And um, they saw it. They took a picture. The police saw it. A police officer saw it and actually picked up some of the items that were uh, on the ground that had come from the car, including a necklace, put, put it back in the car and shut the door. <laughs> We, we, um, we're, we're here with uh, an advocate for uh, Brandon Lawson, and uh, it's a similar situation with Brandon's case, Jason, with uh, his truck being found. And we, we, we ask this question all the time, like, what's the precedent? Like, do you, as a small town police officer, 
immediately go like is that being uh, reactionary is that being too extreme are you being an alarmist if you're like oh a car's on the side of the road something very bad has happened to this person and with Morris case and with um, Brandon Lawson those cars weren't like backed into the side of a house and then I think that's where I get kind of like sort of heated about it because her car was hung up in the in, inside of like ha like in a house Lancy there's, there's Grace is coming out everybody Lancy Grace yeah. That is, that's, that's suspicious. And, and Bruce, you discovered that it was Brianna's car just by, just by, you were, you were reporting her missing at the police station and the guy overheard and you, oh, I found that car. But that's correct. I mean, we actually went in to report, you know, not only we didn't know where Brianna was, but also the car is missing. And he, you know, he was over in the back room there and just said, oh, I, I think I've, you know, come back here a minute, and he opened this file up, and he says, "Is this your car?" And so, and and, and from there, and it yeah, all it was. And yeah. you know, the car was registered to, to my wife at the time, and uh, so, you know, that that connection was never made between. I mean, a, a simple, you know, a simple one or two minutes at the end of his shift to see, you know, well, let me see what the registration is on this car. Maybe we ought to contact this person to see if. Uh, you know, and, you know that you don't know if that would have made the difference, but you know. I have a question about that house. That is uh, <coughs> that kind of sinister old building that you call the Dutch Burn House. Do mm -hmm. you know? Do any of you know what it was? Well, it was owned by two brothers, mm -hmm. and they actually they actually had they were, they suffered from a, a suffered they home invasion. Uh, yeah, there was a home invasion that happened. It was unrelated to Brianna's disappearance. Uh, and then they, I, I'm not sure why they moved out, but they had moved out and, and it was abandoned. And uh, within the past, how many years and it burned down? Like two or three years ago it burned down? Just 2016, I think. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But what, was there anything that was going on at that house? Did people squat there? Or was there any kind of activity around that house? Did teenagers break into it and hang out? Like well, that, that's interesting because we asked uh, Lou Berry, who is um, one of the detectives or one of the police officers. He's retired now. Uh, he's been a police officer for 30-something years, and he's been working with Bruce as well as Greg Overacker, the private investigator. And we've talked to them about that, which is, uh, you know, maybe she was going to meet somebody there, and they were going, you know, they were going to party. But the, the really, like, to, to party at that house was to draw attention to your, to your party because there's not a whole lot on that road, right? And it's pretty yeah. much right there. So if you were going to party, you'd probably go somewhere that was not right on one of the main roads. And I don't think it ever had a reputation for people partying. But it could have been a meeting spot. Like, like I'll see you at the. Could have been a meeting house. spot. Yeah. yeah. It's possible, but I mean, I th I think I've gone through a lot of that myself. And from the place where she left work, it's a small rural ski town. And leaving that ski town, the first place that you get to, there's scattered houses, a couple of small farms, as you leave the place where she worked. And the first place that you get to where nobody can see the road and see what's going on is where that house is. But it was along the route that she would have taken to yes. go home in yes. anyway. Yes. The mile away from her work. You're right. So something happened really close there. <clears throat> Let me, can I ask, um, you know, we, we've talked to several families who uh, are angry at the police and some of them even question police involvement. Did you ever question police involvement in Brianna's case? Uh, I, I think the only time I really did that is just in, in the course of a really, really heated discussion with police one time. I said, well, you know, who's to say that your officer, who happens to be the first one on the scene that we've logged, isn't involved in this? And I said, you know, you, I think if I remember right, it was like, you know, uh, you know, you, you've done such a lousy job that, you know, maybe it's him or something like that. I, I don't recall what I said, but... I was pretty angry when I said it, but I mean, I, I, I don't think I was ever too serious about it. Yeah. It was just a, a matter of you haven't ruled anybody out yet or really tried that hard, but it was really early on. Were there theories that f people voiced that frustrated you because you thought they were irrelevant? Oh, sure. Yeah. Yeah. Now, uh, what about in um, Brandon Lawson and Alyssa Turney's cases? Uh, I know that the families aren't exactly thrilled with police. Is that accurate to say? Yeah, that's very accurate. The uh, family 
in Brandon Lawson's case, they have been in a bitter back and forth battle with each other in, uh, in terms of could they be involved. Mm -hmm. And uh, we, you know, you see that a lot in missing persons cases, especially when the family starts to get frustrated. You know, they want to point the finger back at law enforcement. And don't get me wrong, there are some cases we've seen where law enforcement has been involved, but you know, in a lot of cases, it's just a default. You know, you don't have the answer, so you get frustrated, and uh, you want to you want to chew out law enforcement. Now, how many don't know uh, Brandon Lawson's case? Cool, cool. Can you uh, can you do a, a yeah, Little sure. So, Wikipedia uh, version of it. <laughs> yeah, sure. So, uh, Brandon Lawson uh, was a 26-year-old father of four. He was an oil field worker in uh, living in San Angelo, Texas. He came home on the evening of August 8th, 2013. He got into a disagreement with his wife, and he wanted some cooling off time, and so he decided to leave the house. He left about 11:54 p.m. Uh, he headed north out of the town that he lived in on a very rural highway. And about four miles south of the next town, he runs out of gas. So he calls his brother Kyle and says, hey, I'm out of gas. Can you, you know, get the gas can? Uh, come bring me some gas. Uh, he mentions to Kyle that uh, he's being chased. And uh, Brandon had had some issues with drugs in the past, but he had been sober for about six months. And uh, it is possible that he may have had a relapse. But uh, in any case, you know, the brother says, the brother thinks he might be kind of tripping out, uh, but he says, yeah, let me get the gas can, I'll bring you some gas. So uh, Kyle goes and gets the gas can from uh, Brandon's house, because they only lived about five minutes apart from each other. And he proceeds to head out towards Brandon's location. Well, in the meantime, Brandon makes a very frantic call to 911, saying he's in the middle of a field, he's being chased, he needs the police. Uh, about six minutes after Brandon calls, a passing trucker calls into 911 because Brandon's truck, when it ran out of gas, he kind of parked it half in the road, half on the shoulder. So the truck driver has to swerve around it, and he thinks it uh, presents a road hazard, so he calls it in and says, hey, you know, you got this truck out here. I think you guys need to know about it so you can get it out of the way. So Kyle, Brandon's brother, gets to Brandon's truck about 110 at the same time as a Coke County deputy. And... Uh, Brandon is nowhere to be found. And, you know, Kyle is trying to get a hold of his brother and, you know, call out to him to get him to come out. And uh, at one point they do talk very briefly, and uh, Brandon gets frustrated with Kyle a little bit, and, you know, he hangs up the phone and basically disappears off the face of the earth. And how did you know, uh, how did you know Brandon? What's your connection to him? Uh, I went to high school with Brandon. I was a high school acquaintance of his. Uh, you know, we talked a little bit when we see each other in the hallways and stuff like that. And when he went, uh, he always treated me with a lot of respect. Mm -hmm. And uh, when he went missing, I took it upon myself to try to, you know, reach out to the family and uh, help him in any way that I could and yeah. return some of that respect that Brandon gave to me. Nice. Um, you, you, you are, you're up here because uh, you just came in today, right, or last night? Um, yeah, I got in late last night. And, and we kind of put you on the spot because we were like, <laughs> hop up here. Um, so we appreciate that, and we, we appreciate you being up here as well, and we kind of put you on the spot as well. Go ahead. That. But I think it's important because we are talking about private investigations for the missing, and we're talking about two cases with Brandon and with a list attorney, and these cases have extended past law enforcement's uh, resources. So these are cases that are very, very significant <coughs> examples of what uh, Bruce's organization can do to help. Um, I guess that was just sort of a little side note, but I uh, wanted to say that the situation with the with the drugs is a really unfortunate situation and i think yeah i think it it tends to make people look away from cases like this because it's not um we had a conversation this morning that it's not it's not pretty you know it's not a um it's not juicy enough of a story yeah and <clears throat> and even even with brianna's case there's a there there was the, you know you have that uh um, stigma that is attached to people who grow up in a small town like that yeah. and what they do recreationally is not to, you know legal sometimes and in, and in Brianna's case the police are the ones who put it out there that uh, <laughs> the, and, you know and then I think they apologized but I think that was a huge mistake I mean, even yeah you put it out there and, oh sorry we put it out there we but you can't unring that bell right I mean people are going to look for the the clean all-american person the you know the, the clean all-American white guy or white girl and that's who is that's who we want to save and it's really unfortunate when 
when you have to almost skirt around, well, maybe Brandon, maybe Brandon relapsed, but now we still need to have your attention on that because that's even worse. You know, that's, that, that should speak to a larger problem. Like, Absolutely. Yeah, wh what's going on in someone's life that even causes them to, to want to do that and, and get away? You know, regardless of what a person has going on in their personal lives, you know, whether you're, you're struggling with alcohol, you're struggling with drugs, or, you know, whatever your personal problem is, that does not make your life any less significant. Right. And you still deserve to be searched for. You still deserve to be advocated for. You still deserve to be found and come home to your family. Right. right. Did you find that uh, to be a pretty significant problem when you were, uh, you know, talking to law enforcement? Did they, did they write it off? Well, of course, they wrote it off. I mean, in, in my opinion, I mean, I don't want to sit up here and bash law enforcement because, I mean, they, they did turn around and they did help me and they did some good stuff later I'll do on. It. No, I'm you kidding. Know, <laughs> but, uh, you know, but, I, I mean, in that case, there was different people running early in the investigation than what came later. But those people that ran it early in the investigation, they were getting under a lot of media pressure. Uh, from up in the area where Brianna disappeared and they were under huge pressure to do something and solve the case. So they made a deliberate decision, in my opinion, to put uh, a drug involvement issue out there, which the local newspaper was happy to print on the front page, and they had no facts to back that up. So it was a deliberate way to get the media pressure to come off them because they're fully aware, you know, just what you said here, that, uh, you know, people like a perfect victim. Yeah. yeah. And so they used that, and then they had to retract it. And, of course, the newspaper actually retracted it also. But, you know, as in newspaper retractions do, you get a, you know, one inch on the back page. But the damage is done. And in this Internet world, you know, the damage is done permanently, you know. And, uh, Octavia, can you tell us a little bit about um, the attorneys, or at least Sarah attorneys, um, experience with police. And how many people don't know about uh, Alyssa Turney? Cool. Okay. okay. So Alyssa Attorney disappeared in 2001. So she's been gone for 19 years. Uh, she was 17 years old. Uh, she was a teenager from Phoenix. Um, on her last day of school, she um, was picked up by her stepfather, and never, no one ever saw her again. So, unfortunately, the case wasn't actually investigated for about six or seven years after her disappearance. And that's because, well, there's really no excuse for it, but the reason is that um, aside from her, um, her being reported missing, there was just no investigation because it looked like she, had, um, she didn't have a great relationship with her stepfather and it just looked like she had ran away. And so nobody really did anything until there was a false confession from someone in Florida, like a convicted felon in Florida, who said that he had killed her um, just for fame. But uh, at that point, the FBI got involved and started digging deeper. And um, they did a Phoenix Police Department did a very extensive investigation, which unfortunately led nowhere. But what, what did happen is that there was a search warrant uh, served to her stepfather's home, and they, but they didn't find any evidence relating to a murder. Uh, they found a huge amount of circumstantial evidence, including um, so many people you know, that came forward with allegations that Alyssa had been telling people that her stepfather was uh, sexually abusing her and exhibiting all sorts of other controlling behavior. Um, but they unfortunately didn't find any hard evidence and they didn't find a body and um, but what they did find in her stepfather's home was um, an arsenal of illegal weapons and pipe bombs so that he went to federal prison for um, allegedly uh, plotting a terrorist attack so he was out for about 10 years um, he's free now and um, he has not yet been charged with uh, murder is that the question? Sure. Just the yeah. general. Thank you. Yeah. That's a whole lot yeah. to pack into, like, yeah. give us a broad view. Because, so, I mean, you're very familiar with the case, and, and yeah. her father, her stepfather, is a very horrible individual, and you've spoken to him. 
I have interviewed him, yes. He had never given an interview to anybody, law enforcement. Um, he did to ABC News in 2008, but that was the last time. Um, yeah, that was a very intense interview. But this investigation was kind of foiled by the fact that it didn't start uh, until it was too late. So much of the evidence was gone. There was no receipts, no surveillance cameras, uh, phone records were mostly gone. So unfortunately, uh, we lost a lot of crucial evidence because of, because of their shortcomings. Are you working with, I know you're working with Sarah, her sister. Um, are you working, is she working with any uh, licensed private investigator uh, independently? No, she doesn't have the funds for that at this oh. time, but. I, I happen to know an organization that could raise <laughs> funds for it. <laughs> well, there we go. Um, what's been, uh, Bruce, what's been the most surprising thing to you since starting the organization and um, seeing what type of people reach out and, uh, and if you could, if, is there a couple of things that stand out to you? Well, the, I mean, the response has been really, really good as far as people, you know, everyone I've talked to realize that this need is out there. And, I mean, it's, it's just a tremendous need. And, uh, you know, it, it's, it's so understandable, I guess. Yeah. Not that I'm a great presenter, but it just makes it so, you know, it's easy to see. You know, this is the problems people face, and this is the need that they face, and, and they need this help. And so it's, um, you know, it's, it, it, I can start to see things start to come together around the edges of this stuff. But the funding is critical. I mean, it's going to cost money to be able to pay even people that are willing to investigate for, you know, and do a certain amount of pro bono parts of the investigation stuff. It's still going to cost money to do it. And how will private investigations work with law enforcement, current law enforcement, who is investigating the same case that the private investigator is? Well, that's, you know, I mean, a couple of things we thought to work out is, I mean, two of the members on the board, and this is where I say I don't want to bash police, because two of the members on the board were former heads of Vermont State Police that retired and wanted to be involved in this and get on the board. So, uh, you know, those two guys, I was treated very, very well under their administrations with uh, with work they did with Brianna, and they wanted to be involved in this. So, so one of the reasons that they're on the board, outside of their actual skills at investigating and setting up investigations and overseeing investigations, is to be able to reach out from one police head to another, um, to different police departments over the country, and build up that rapport of police to police, and set boundaries and different things, that, so that everybody feels comfortable in the process. And um, so, so that is definitely one aspect of the way it's planned for, because it's, it's, there's no doubt in my mind if we're dealing with this, and I mean, from having Lou Barry in, when Lou Barry has contact with Vermont State Police, him being an ex-police chief down in Boston, or Massachusetts, sir, but he has a very, very different rapport with the police, and they're willing to work with him because there's certain unsaid rules of, okay, we know you're not going to release this, you know you're not going so it, it works it works really really well so so that's one of the things that we're looking for not exclusively in investigators but we feel that there's a whole untapped pool of resource of retired ex-police officers looking for something to do looking to uh, you know achieve some um, you know do some good in the world and be able to do some of that work and have that edge of that experience there are. There are a lot of them out there who are willing to help in that way. And uh, some of them are right outside that door over there right next to Bruce's booth. Yeah. Um, Jim Nanos and Nicole, they run uh, PI Magazine and Unsolved Magazine, and they randomly emailed uh, the private investigations for the missing website and said, hey, we'd love to help. And we had already had a relationship with these people. We knew them. So they're uh, very cool people. And, yeah. Uh, I, I, definitely support them as well. I think that's a really good example of the network that you're trying to build, Bruce, is that Jim and Nicole came into Tim and, like, our world uh, last year at CrimeCon, or was it two years ago? It was Crime last Con. year. It was last year at CrimeCon, and they were, they were such great people, and they, they wanted to, you know, talk to us about our podcasts and how um, their magazine can, can, you know, connect with people, and then they started Unsolved Magazine, which is more geared towards the citizen detective, whereas PI Magazine is geared towards licensed private investigators. It's like a trade magazine, and it, I, I love the fact that this network you're trying to build has had 
such an immediate uh, like result. Like he, he, we get, we, we were getting tons of emails, and then all of a sudden we see Jim Nanos's name pop up in the inbox, and he's like, "Here's what I do. I'd love to help." And we wrote back, "We're like, Jim, it's us. <laughs> we know you." And um, and he he just like that is that is a great immediate result of the of the network you're trying to to build. Um, and I think it's also interesting that there's uh, the focus you're trying to put on how law enforcement can work with the private uh, investigators on the same ca on the same case, even if they're not working with them on the same case. I think a lot of uh, non-licensed private investigators or citizen detectives can look to that as an example of how do I even, you know, interact with law enforcement. Um, what, what, have, what have you discovered working with Greg and, and Lou, Greg being licensed and Lou being a retired police officer? He's also a licensed PI. And he is a licensed PI, yeah. So good example there. How do, how do they work together? What's, what's, Greg's, uh, what's Greg's code when he's dealing with law enforcement? Was he like kicked the door down? And <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, uh, Greg and Lou work very, very well together because they each quickly came to respect each other's uh, talents and uh, unique abilities uh, to talk to people. Uh, you know, but, uh, you know, Greg's a... Greg's a former bounty hunter and uh, private investigator, and you know, Lou's a former policeman. And, and I, I guess I'll leave Greg's style at the fact that Greg's a former bounty hunter for a long, long time. Okay, <laughs> badass. And, and, and I, te I need that uh, too. And uh, and and Lou can definitely work a lot more behind the scenes, uh, and seems to. They both have very terrific minds for be able to sort out. The junk from the non-junk, and you know that. Yeah, I think I think it's amazing to watch Greg work and to hear his stories because, like you said, he was a bounty hunter. So there's a situation where you have to move fast and you have to be aggressive at times, and he can be. But he's also like a, an amazing human being. Like he'll 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 text us, he'll call us, like he, like random stuff. He's just an amazing human being. But he's also extraordinarily insightful and patient. And I think that was one of the things that. Um, he, he always likes to stress is when you're working with law enforcement, if, you're, if you have information, if you're doing your own independent investigation, that's fine. But if you give stuff to law enforcement, and this is coming from Greg Overacker, you're not going to see that. Like, they'll, they'll never tell you. They'll never tell you the process. They'll never, you can follow up with them and you can follow up with them and keep following up with them because that means that, you know, they know that there's still attention on this case, but don't expect to hear anything back. They're not going to call you back and say, hey, remember that, uh, that, that carpet sample you sent in? Yeah, well, we pulled some DNA and it turns out to be this person. You know, they'll never give you that information, but yesterday we were talking about the squeak or the greasy wheel getting the squeak um, <laughs> the other way around. If, if you keep talking, that's, the, that's what you need to do. I'm rambling. So <laughs> Uh, those two guys, Bruce and Greg, are, are amazing at what they do and kind of adorable when they're uh, separate because they each will compliment the other one. Like uh, we, were, we did a live show in Nashua a couple weeks ago and um, I was outside with Greg before it started and he's like, man, I got to hang out with Lou more. He's like, he's so smart. I just, I need to just talk to him more. And Greg will basically say, I mean, uh, Lou will say the same thing about Greg. <laughs> in, conver in conversing with him, that's great. Um, but I will, I will say, with with law enforcement, I mean, is what I've become. I mean, it, it, I mean, I went from a when Brianna first went missing, I went from a role of you expect when you have a when you know nothing and have no inter interactions with police your entire life, you go through a role of okay, well, I you know, this is what the police do and this is what they're for. And that's probably all influenced by TV when they work and solve cases and do things like that. So you go in with the mindset of they're really going to do something and this is what they're going to do. And you, you, you get disappointed again and again and again. And it becomes adversarial really, really quick. And it goes through that adversarial program. And, and you know, I went through a time where probably maybe a year with law enforcement where I didn't care how mad I made them. I didn't care how much they said. I, I got in screaming matches with them. Uh, you know, and watched them come and go, and then you get to a point then where some of them, you realize that law enforcement is like any other, you know, organization out there in the world. There's good and bad people in law enforcement, and there's a lot of them that aren't bad, but they're just in there and plodding along doing their jobs. But um, what I've come to realize is, is that really, as a parent, you walk a really, really fine line with this, because what you want to do is you're 
in, in my mind is I'm not afraid to agitate him a little bit. I'm not afraid to make him mad a little bit because sometimes making him mad motivates. But there's nothing that motivates them more than a lot of pressure from the outside, from media. And they can be mad at you, and, but if there's still media pressure, they still have to do that. But the honest truth is they're the power of the state. And that's what I came to realize a long, long time ago. There, I mean, you can do all the private investigating, finding this and finding that, and do all that work in the world, but they're the only ones that are going to put the cuffs on somebody and take them to court and finish it. They are the finishers. And so in order to ever see anything finish, you have to walk that line where they're willing to be partnership enough with you to be able to be the finishers. Yeah, as uh, Lou said on our live show in, in Nashua, he said that police officers have to abide by the Constitution, whereas private investigators don't. They can do, they can work a little bit outside the lines, but with, in, in the case of those guys, they will deliver that information to the appropriate place. Um, do you, uh, Jason, have any licensed private investigator that you work with for Brandon's case? Uh, there is a private investigator that was working Brandon's case uh, she she's kind of she's kind of like the rest of us are in the case you know until we can actually get onto the property and search uh, she you know you kind of hit we've kind of hit like a brick wall uh, the land where Brandon Lawson went missing is privately owned and the landowners have so far denied us any more access to their land and uh, the sheriff kind of you know sticks with the landowners and so it it's kind of you know it's it's just stonewalled you know what can you do you know you can take the risk of jumping the fence onto private property and getting into serious trouble for it and so you you know we're we're bound by the laws just like everybody else you know you want to try to respect landowners wishes but at the same time you know a human being has gone missing on your property Right, right. Yeah, Possibly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You, you said something earlier today where you were like, you know, it's not like I'm going to find my football that I threw over your fence. Like, I'm yeah. trying to find a human being. Um, what's, what's your relationship been like with, uh, with law enforcement, just coming as like a, like a citizen? Well, so far they have not uh, really talked to me. No I have re Yeah, I've reached out uh, to them a couple of times, and I never got a call back. However, uh, back in March, we went down to Bront, and we were doing some work down there, and uh, one of the people that I worked very closely with on Brandon's case was actually able to sit down and interview a member of law enforcement, and we learned a lot from that interview. Um, Bruce, where where is uh, the Brianna's case at now? Have, has there been any? Uh, have have you walked like worked through other leads, and has there been any new leads that you're able to talk about? Well, we we have a lead now that I would just I would just say I I don't know how promising it is, but it's 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 one of the probably one of the better leads we've had within the last three or four years uh, and I'm really not at liberally to say about it but there is some stuff happening in there that I'm encouraged for and uh, and we'll just see where it goes where did it come from it actually came from the private investigators through contacts people had made to them and uh, it uh, they they put the lead together, basically. They did it was what I would what I would consider to be doing it right. Uh, they did all the invest. They received some information from one family member, uh, then followed it up with another family member, then followed it up with interviews, then documented everything, and then uh, at some point we had some discussions about it. But we felt as far as we could go with it, so we turned it over to the state police at that point. Here's here's our case which is frustrating because it's here's our case, okay, and now, you know, they're in kind of a gray area where, you know, the information only goes one way in, in most cases, but they are working on it, um, and we'll see how it all works out. I have a question. So, as we all know, the events that occurred in the days prior to someone disappearing are typically really significant for the most part. Do you, uh, and I'm thinking specifically of the incident where Brianna was attacked by a friend, a girlfriend, do you think that that had anything to do with it? And then my follow-up question would be, I know you can't tell us about this lead, but does this lead have any kind of, is, is it related to anything that happened to the days prior to her disappearance? No. 
No, I don't think it has anything to do with it. No, no to the no first to, question or to both. To both. Okay. <laughs> so the the incident that you're talking about is um, at the uh, it was a party. It was sort of a, a big gathering and. Um, they were friends. It, Brianna was friends with this other young lady, uh, young woman, and, and there was some suspicion that she might have been uh, seeing her boyfriend or what, you know, adolescent type back and yeah. forths. And uh, there was also some confusion as to when this happened or where it happened. Was it in a, it was in a truck and then she sort of kind of sucker punched her? Yeah, that's how it was for years, and then you know later on, other information came out that maybe that didn't happen that way. But what happened was, you know, I mean, uh, one girl punched my daughter, and my daughter chose not to fight back for whatever reason. And uh, you know, I, I just think it was a it was a, a mini teenage scuffle, and it was really nothing other than Brianna disappeared afterwards. It's just it was, uh, you know, so. Mm -hmm. I, I don't put anything. Yeah. Um, what's what's your uh, experience been with working with law enforcement? Mine. Yeah, with with Alyssa's case. I've been very fortunate that they were very open with me and uh, provided me with all the work that they have had done so far. See, I find this so interesting <laughs> that you know, it's like I can't get a phone call back, and you're like, they're <laughs> like, here you go, here's our entire case file. Um, what do you think that is? Why do you think that's the case? My smile. Yeah, I know. I know. <laughs> I don't know. I think I, I got lucky. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, do you want to uh, open it up for some questions from the crowd? Yeah, yeah. Does okay. anybody have any questions about any of these cases? Sure, and we have some mics there in the middle. All right, so my question's about Brandon. Um, so I know that like in one of the last podcast recordings that the brother I believe had come on and there was a bridge like that yep. was known to what they thought it was gunshots and the brother had corrected it and said that it was he thought he was sitting under a bridge and that was cars driving like over the bridge yeah so we actually took some audio samples when we were down there in March to see if we could prove that that sound was in fact uh, the sound of a car going over that bridge and uh, the sounds are similar Typically, when you have a gunshot on an audio recording, it, it does not produce a sound similar gunshot. to what's on that call. When you have a gunshot on an audio, it sounds a very high pitch. It's almost like a whip cracking, a real pop. Right. And I, I just don't think that sound is, is gunshots. That 911 call, you can hear it. You can go to YouTube and you can hear it. You can hear it broken down. You can hear it slowed, you know, sped up. Everyone's trying to, like, analyze it, and they should, you know, because it's, uh, it's the last thing that people have heard from him. Um, do you think that that is, what's the benefit and what's the drawback of having such, um, like, analyzation happen for this, for this phone call? Because you get these comments like, there's gunshots. I know there's gunshots. And like, eh, there's no, no fun. You know, I've, I've said this a million times. I could put that call in a room. I could, I could get 30 people in a room and play that call, and all 30 of them are going to come up to me and tell, they, tell me they hear different things. If you're going to look into Brandon's case, I think the 911 call is a very, very vital piece of the case, and it almost overshadowed the rest of the case. That call has been analyzed by everybody who has heard it. Um, I don't think that that call is the end-all, be-all. I mean, let, let's say you could tell me everything that is said on that call. Okay, my question to you is, all right, great. Where's Brandon? Right. What yeah. exactly happened? Right. And he, he I don't think you He never says like, oh, I'm, yeah. Yeah. these you people can, are chasing me. Right, you can make out most of what he says, most yeah. of it, but it doesn't make a ton of sense. No. Has anybody surfed like the area, like the highway, like right off of the... the uh, yes, both the family and law enforcement have done some searches there. Uh, you know, initially they focused primarily on the area where Brandon's truck was found. And, you know, they're going to do that. Anytime you have a person missing, they're, they're going to focus on where they found the vehicle. And uh, they didn't turn up anything. Uh, it was a short time later, um, some cell phone ping information come out that places Brandon in an area that's slightly north of where his truck was found. And it's right up by the Colorado River. Uh, unfortunately, the terrain in that area is horrible. You know, there's cactus, mesquite brush, there's rattlesnakes, wild hogs. It's not a place you want to be running around 1 o'clock in the morning. Uh, that area has yet to be thoroughly, thoroughly searched. Uh, they did fly over the area with a helicopter, um, and they just they didn't see anything. There's, I know a lot of people keep asking, could Brandon have fallen into the river? 
the river at that time was only about knee deep and it's not a flowing body of water it's still standing uh so could he have fallen into it yeah but i don't think he would have met his demise because of that um ladessa brandon's uh, girlfriend at the time she did fly over the river in a helicopter and they, just, they did not see anything in the river sorry <laughs> hi um so i have a question for jason uh my husband and i've been listening to the recording and this is the only true crime thing i can get him into because we used to live in odessa oh wow uh, actually when it happened so <clears throat> did did brandon carry a, a gun he's out in the middle of uh, did he have one in his car? Did they own one? They did own one, but we, uh, to our knowledge, Brandon did not have it with him. He didn't have it with him. And then one more question. Sure. This has been a big thing in our house. So I believe I heard that, I think from the brother, that the sheriff and his wife, his wife owns the newspaper? Yes, that's correct. Is that correct? Yeah. So what has the media pressure been from within? Well, unfortunately, Brandon hasn't got any big media attention, which is one reason I attended CrimeCon here today was to try to get some of that for Brandon. Uh, you know, he's been on several podcasts. I know a lot of podcasts have covered him. Uh, he's gotten some small news bits from your local news stations, but he hasn't had anything like big, like a you know one hour deal or anything like that. Are you guys looking to do that? Yes, that's yes. <clears throat> that's one. Again, that's one reason I'm here is to try to get you know somebody big to take a look at him. Hopefully. Brandon Lawson, that's my, I hate to say favorite case, but it is. But I do have a question. I've been listening to Missing Alyssa, and it's amazing. You did a great job. Thank you. Um, the interview with the stepfather is crazy, and I can't, you kept your composure. I don't know if I could have done that. My question is, did he ever try to reach back out to you? He just seems kind of crazy. So I was curious if he ever tried to make contact again. We never made contact again. I never called him back, and he never... Uh, contacted me I I I don't know I, I feel bad speculating on this but there have been a few times where I felt like a fake profile that you know because I I'm not paranoid but I do you know before I accept typically my social media profiles are private and before I accept someone I, I just take a look at their profile and a lot of times there's fake profiles and most of the time it doesn't mean anything but there have been a couple of times where I had reason to believe that there was a profile that might have been him or a person um, close to him just because of just a bit of investigating that I did on those profiles. So perhaps like he's, I wouldn't doubt that he's watching my social media and, um, but yeah, it took me many months to come around to make that phone call because I was, uh, quite frankly, I was scared to be associated you know, I, I just didn't want to be on his radar. I know he, I knew he hadn't listened to my podcast, and I knew that when I called him and interviewed him that he would then go ahead and do it, and I didn't know if he was going to sue me or, or worse. Interesting. Thank you. You're welcome. Definitely check out the Missing Alyssa podcast. It is excellent, and that interview is really wild. Yeah. Um, speaking of doing things on your own, because you reached out and to, you know, you built up the... Uh, um, Courage. You know, the brave, yeah, the courage to, to, to do that on your own. Um, my, I have a question for Bruce about that. Have you ever gone on your own to interview somebody who you thought might have been connected with Brianna's disappearance? Have you gone on properties? Have oh, you, yes, yeah. many times. Alone? It's, yes. Does that get pretty dangerous? Yeah, what is it? Yeah. Sometimes it got pretty dangerous. I mean, I did a lot of just uh, alone searching. I mean, a lot of we had a couple of searches. People went out to help and search, but uh, yeah, I, I talked to a number of different people early on, and uh, you know, I I don't know. Uh, I I had one incident was the last incident, but I can just say guns came out, mm. and so on, sounds on pretty both, intense. On, yeah, it was it got pretty intense. So I, at that point, I realized in my own mind, I said, you know, I shouldn't be the one doing this one because you know when you when you're really emotionally investigated you tend to not be a good question asker you just go right in somebody's face and start asking him questions and that was a really dumb idea in retrospect in a lot well, of ways the emotion can kind of cloud your yeah judgment. it clouds your judgment it clouds your questioning and clouds everything so well i think that's really amazing that you can recognize that and you did recognize that at a certain point so just want to give you props for that I actually have never released this information, but 
Are we uh, breaking news? Breaking here? news. Oh, no, there was one incident I, I didn't talk about it on the podcast because it was just so awkward and embarrassing and terrifying. But I went with Sarah to uh, the home where Alyssa last lived in, and it's a rental home now. And um, we just knocked on the door and the people living there let us in and they were quite friendly, but they were also pretty terrifying looking people. Um, it was an elderly woman and her uh, adult son living together and they were just unkempt and just st very strange. Um, but you know, everything was going fine and they let us in and they showed us the house and it was so surreal to be in that home. Um, and we had, you know, I clearly had my mic right there and, and we told them and for some reason they just, they didn't understand, they didn't see it, it was a small mic. Um, and at the end when I said, is it okay if I use this interview, they were just like, what interview? And they looked at each other and they're like, you were recording this? And I'm like, yes, like I told you. Did you, did you just go cold at that point? Were you like, oh, we were no. just, they, they were, they were scary. And so um, I said, it's okay. I don't have to use the interview. That's fine. Like, l just l let let us go. You know, <laughs> like, because I didn't have to use it. Like, if you know, without their consent. I mean, I, I still could have, but I wasn't going to if they didn't want me to. But they just looked at each other and then looked at us, and we just couldn't get out of there fast enough. And then they chased us out and they chased um, you out. Took photos of my car and my license plate, oh, and gosh. that was oh. so scary. That went wrong fast. Huh? That yeah. was yeah. <clears throat> well, I want. I don't want to. Um, I uh, uh, let the comment that Bruce said about uh, guns came out go un <laughs> unanswered. What happened? Like, guns came out? Uh, you approached someone's property and they immediately came out with guns? I, I'm not going to go into that story. Oh, I'm my just God. Not. I'm sorry. <laughs> wow, okay. <laughs> well, I didn't want to talk about my incident for about a year and a half after it happened because I was so scared that those people would come after me so I can understand. Yeah, wow. Wow. <laughs> anything happen with you? Yeah, Jason. Anything? Any uh, uh, no danger? Uh, <laughs> other other than the uh, having to worry about the rattlesnakes and the wild hogs, I have never had a bad encounter with anybody. Thankfully, uh, anytime I go down there, I'm very very cautious of my surroundings. Uh, you know, just because there are wild hogs and rattlesnakes in the area and other dangers, I I am armed when I go down there. But uh, I I pray that I never ever have to, you know come into a situation where I'm forced to draw my weapon. I mean, it, it, I guess that can, you know, it speaks to this whole wave of people doing their own independent investigations and how much danger you do put yourself in. And I think you don't realize the danger until later, you know, when we went on that hike for the Oxygen Show. That was a legit 15-hour hike, and we only after did we think about that. This is a hike to coordinates. I don't want to get into it, but it was it was horrible. And um, we were in the woods, and we were like slamming our shovels down into the ground. And only afterward uh, did you did I start thinking, wow, I, what if bees came out? I mean, we would have we would have had nowhere to go. Like we would have been stung to death by bees. If I mean, what are we doing? We're we're in the, we're on the side of a mountain, just slamming a shovel into the ground. Did you just watch My Girl? <laughs> Pack your bee suit next time, Lance. Yeah, yeah. I needed I needed Tim's uh, mosquito net, but um, yeah. Well, I, I think good my girl reference, by <laughs> the way. You. I think what you're what Bees. you're getting what, is is what you're getting at, kind of like a, like an intensity during searches where uh, yeah. you kind of get carried away a little bit at times. Yeah, and also there are other people out there. The only reason why we were there is because we were sent coordinates from some dick who was like. We want to, we want to like mess around with you guys. Yeah, trying to be creepy. Just to, just yeah. to lead you on a wild goose chase. Yeah. So my really long-winded point is: Have you guys ever experienced anything where you have people reaching out to you and saying you need to check this out? And what do you do because you know that it might be something that is uh, potentially dangerous? Uh, well, I, I mean, I have had people reach out to me and say, "Hey, you need to check this out. Hey, you need to check that out." And if I feel like it's anything viable, I immediately pass it on to the PI. Okay. And uh, the, the PI that has been working on Brandon's case, she's a wonderful lady, and she's a very, very good private investigator. You know, you just have to take the tip and weigh it against what you know and determine whether it's a viable tip or not. Mm -hmm. And if it is, you send it on to the proper channels, and if not, you kind of just kind of, you know, note it and yeah. move on. Yeah. What about, what about you, Bruce? Were you following up on everything as it came in, no matter what, from any, uh, any direction? Uh, initially, I mean, it, 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 
I mean, when when Brianna went missing and it first hit the news, it would it, people would call because it was somehow easy to find my number, and they would call <laughs> and and it would just be I, I don't know crazy stuff. You know, I heard this or that, and you know, and some of it no, we didn't follow it up. I just thought it, and it was just kind of. I mean, even then, in a, in a really bad state of mind, you just realize some stuff seems a little seems a little crazy. So you follow up and talk to, you know, talk to the people that, but it, it, talk to people that you thought had, may have actually known something, you know, mm -hmm. friends or, or at least people that connected and knew who Brianna was, you know, and, um, you know, we obviously, I, I did some of that, I took my son along sometimes when I knew it was going to be a dangerous area, mm -hmm. uh, took, uh, you know, a friend of mine or something along, uh, when I knew it was going to be dangerous, um, but uh, you know, you just it, it gets very, very frustrating. And that's why I feel for law enforcement because you know you you always get and even private the private investigators. You get to the next stage of where so and so told me this, and then you talk to so and so, and then the next person says, "Well, I didn't say that, or I didn't have any." Or, or you get to those innocent things where someone, two people are standing in a grocery store and the next person from the next pile over is talking to someone else and says, well, I know what happened to that Maitland girl. So you hear, you hear the information from the person that's in the other aisle and it's just two people talking that neither of them know either. You know, it's just, and the rumor mill goes crazy and it's just an endless nightmaric cycle. And, and that's a, an actual scenario that played out, right? In reality with you, right? At the, yes. at the convenience store? Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. That was, I mean, that's just a good example of how, yeah. how people that don't even mind. Don't, it wasn't somebody saying, oh, there was a rumor. You know, it's just where an innocent talk where someone says, you know, what they, you know, they're saying, I know. But really, they're saying to somebody, I think. Yeah. And someone else hears it, a third person, and it goes into a rumor that can't be corroborated, can't be substantiated, and wastes people's time. Now, you don't live up in that area anymore, right? No. Okay. Um, how often does uh, Bruce or, or Lou go back or, or yourself to follow up on one of those leads? They ha I'm, I'm sorry, uh, Greg, Greg, Greg. How Greg. often does Greg or Lou go back? Uh, they, go, they go up really as, as, as a viable type of lead come in. They investigate. But the, because they, neither of them live in the area, they have to plan the trip and uh, say, okay, we're going to try to see so many people. And we have so many leads, so they have to try to set it up. And that's one of the things I want to try to avoid with uh, with private investigations to the missing is, you know, I want to develop a, a group of investigators that are local to the area that right. they're at, so they can be within a half an hour or so away from where it happens, so they can work an hour here, an hour there, and, and be close. And and that's the one thing that uh, you know is it, just kind of critical there that we get something like that going. Right, not only uh, for the case of, or the situation where they have to go and do some, you know, boots on the ground or hands-on uh, investigation, maybe search a scene, but they can go directly to the police station there. They can go directly to where some records are kept. That Absolutely. saves a lot of money as far as, you know, uh, filing for a freedom of information and then, you know, getting that, like, that costs money to get the, to get files and then you ship it and you have to wait, so there's some expense there. Just having them close and and uh, accessible to those records and to law enforcement, I think is super important and a, and a good thing to uh, sort of triangulate on with the And I think, I mean, culturally, it's very important too. And I mean, if, if you're in a, if you're an investigator that's really local, you kind of really, you know, you know how that local culture works and you know how to work into that local culture. You know who to talk to, who's the one that knows stuff, who doesn't know stuff. I mean, one of the instances, uh, I remember is I mean in, where Brianna where Brianna lived and we lived it was a it was a rural area farming forestry uh, right across the border from Canada a lot of French Canadian influence and stuff like that going on in there and uh, I, I mean I used to joke the small town I live was there was just about as much uh, French spoken as English there mm -hmm. and uh, but you know I, the, the 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 police the first quote investigator the Vermont State Police went up was came up from Burlington which was the big city in Vermont and you know she was running around with a road map trying to find this was early before GPS type days but they're running around trying to find people and find you know they had they were getting lost 
you know, we had stories later on. Some of the investigators said, "Hey, you know, well, we took kind of took took that person off the case because you know she, got, you know." So you need, I, I, I guess, the the point is you need somebody to really culturally that's in that area because that that's what makes it, in my mind that's what makes it work. Yeah, yeah. Um, do we have time for <coughs> more questions? Uh, we're pretty much out of time. Are I we? think maybe maybe one more question. Does anyone if have we've got a quick okay. one? Yeah. On the way driving here, um, my girlfriend and I kind of binged on to live and die in LA, and they were talking about this technology through Google. It's like takeout.google.com, where they were literally tracing footsteps. The guy went around the back of the convenience store, and I know it's way too late <coughs> for for Brianna or Alyssa, but is that something that could possibly be done to trace Jason? I don't know. What Yes, actually, this is something that we are looking into. Google data, yes. Uh, the, some of the people that I work with on the case are looking into that. We're going to see if we can apply that to Brandon's case if it's not too late, yeah. That's also something, actually, uh, we're looking into even as old as it is in Brianna's case because that's something I was not aware of, but I always thought, well, the, you know, the government had certain satellites out even back then, but then I became aware that there were a number of private companies that actually had satellites back then. So, uh, you know, and so that's kind of one of the things I have someone sorting through me now is going through the private companies and seeing if they can get any satellite data even back from 2004. So, a great question. Yeah. Great question. Well, thank you very much, everybody, for joining us for yeah. uh, Crawl Space Live. And uh, please uh, stop by the PIs for the Missing booth today or tomorrow. Yeah, give them your email address and then you can get information for that and uh, if you know anybody who's interested or if you know, you know, private investigators or whatever, any information is uh, good information but we'll get out of here. Uh, thank you. Thanks very for much, coming. Guys. Everybody.